first of all, thank you so much to you for giving me your time. My pleasure. <laughs> and as I told you, um, as a part of our course study, we, we, we do internship. So during internship, we have to work on pro project or maybe topic. So mine will be about the impact or the effect of volunteer motivation on the hub performance. So I will be asking you some questions. Uh, thank you for your time. My pleasure, and it's an interesting topic. Um, first of all, can you tell me who you are in general? And that's it. <laughs> that's such from a your where I, to from the creation of hub. Uh, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, There are a couple of thoughts that just came to mind, of course, um, and um, I guess ultimately for all of us, it's important for us to decide each who we are. Um, although that that's also questionable, in that um, there are thoughts to say that we are who we think others, how we think others think we are. So perhaps what I'm describing to you is a mixture of all of the impressions I've got of who I am from. But in any case, in this moment, uh, I've come to see myself as um, I'm a father of two children. Um, I have given my adult life to assist as best I can community development in Morocco. That experience has brought me to other places around the world. Um, I'm a, a brother. I'm a son. I've given my best energy to develop the organization, the Hyatless Foundation. It's an idea that I carried with me for some years prior to when it was founded in 2000. I guess like all things, um, our, what we commit ourselves to is also a reflection of what occurred prior to that commitment or that organization. And uh, I am a former Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco. I'm a former Associate Peace Corps director, also in Morocco. And those experiences were hugely important um, for things that followed in my life. Um, I'm, my undergraduate degree is in economics from New York. And of course, what brought me to New York is um, informative in terms of who I am. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, in the Midwest of the United States. My parents are Iraqi, Jewish, and the reason why I was born in the United States is an Iraqi Jewish story, which becomes an American story. Um, my master's degree is in international development uh, which was enabled by my Peace Corps experience. My PhD is in sociology, and sociology gives the flexibility and freedom to explore social phenomena from multiple perspectives using a, a ranging methods. So who I am, um, I am I'm someone who questions a lot mm -hmm. myself and things around me. So I guess I'm a bundle of thought, and perhaps we all are in some way, a bundle of emotion, trying to be good to myself and others. 
you know, you know, someone trying his best. <laughs> and who are you? <laughs> who are you? Me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I will ask you at the end of the video, maybe. <laughs> okay, it's a it's a good question, and maybe I took it more deeply than how sometimes that's typically asked of us. But um, I tried to be as as honest as I can in that answer, <laughs> and so will you when when you choose to answer it. Hopefully, it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> I'm a student. Uh, I came from my country to to study in Morocco um, because the opportunity of Morocco of studying in Morocco is better than my country. And where is your country? Mali. Then <laughs> I'm a brother. I'm the older. I'm the older son of my father. And I have one brother, a little brother, and a little sister. So, yeah, I'm doing my best to make proud my father. That's nice. Me. I'm sure you're <laughs> you you're succeeding so well at that. Thank you so much. And of course, um, the opportunity I have to be in the hub is really I have no word to describe it because it's my first time to be in an NGO, especially the hub. So I'm just enjoying enjoying it and to think about um, next week is my last year it makes me sad. But I'm thinking about coming back coming back also after um, the last semester this year, maybe in May, from May to, to June, so... <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> I really do. And I'm so glad that this experience was meaningful to you, and you brought a lot of, um, a lot of... You were an important part of our team, you've helped us a lot, you helped us see things in... Um, in ways that make us better and so uh, we're really grateful that you were part of us for the time you were here and you're always needed and we hope you come back thank you so much <laughs> and next question mm -hmm. what can you tell me about half its values and Especially what motivate, motivated you to create a foundation such as HAP? I think when we consider the value of the Hyatt's Foundation, it really is ultimately measured by how communities of Morocco evaluate that value or determine that what that value is. On one level, <clears throat> we can measure, and we do, the, imp the kinds of impacts that we have. How many people, how much income, how much clean water, how many households, how many uh, women experience different characteristics of empowerment, how many youth, in what way, where, in what time frame. All of these things are part of the value of the Hyatt Foundation. However, I've come to see, and I think this is a an ancient idea, but I've come to see it manifest in our own experience, that it is 
impossible, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm someone who believes that everything is possible. But what I'm about to say is, in fact, impossible. It's impossible for us today to know ultimately the value of our endeavors today. That the consequences of our actions carry forward decades and generations and sometimes even centuries. And in some cases even millennia. Now I'm not saying that's the case of the Highest Foundation, but what I am saying is that there are generational impacts. And that's part of its value. And I can't tell you that if the organization were to stop in this moment, there will still be implications and consequences and outcomes that we can measure of the Hyatt's Foundation in 10, 20 years from now. Certainly in regards to the millions of trees, fruit trees that have been planted, but also as well in regards to <clears throat> the the deep and lasting impact that empowering initiatives have had on rural women and youth that have had um, few opportunities in their lives and yet have them and <clears throat> and so and what's the consequences not just on their lives but on their daughters and sons and husbands and wives and families and communities and so forth and so you know it, I'm, I'm saying this because you know all, we all of us feel at some points in our lives is what I'm doing worthy is this important? And we feel discouragement. And we're, we question ourselves and the years of effort, effort that we've given to projects, initiatives, programs, ideas. But we always also at the same time have to remind ourselves that we don't know really the implications down the line of what we do. And um, and there are this you know there are scriptures that say this and there are philosophers that say this and there are world leaders that say this and um, civil rights you know people that have led the way in all different areas and when you look at how they've written how they spoke and how they communicated this idea really exists. In, the, in all these, through all these people in times and places. So um, the value of the Hyatt's Foundation, you know, we have an annual report that describes it. But there's an, but my heart and my hopes and my dreams are for that value that we can't see, but we know, and we can't take for granted either, but we know that in time will be revealed and will come because of the kinds of impacts that we see already and that they cannot help but generate future ones for years ahead. There are um, there's some answers. <clears throat> well, I mean, first I'd say that the Hylas Foundation <clears throat> has had more than a hundred volunteers over the past thirteen months, fourteen months, and so we cannot say something that 
describes a level of motivation across the entirety of them. But you know, but I, I will say some general observations. And I'll say something, too, about how we as an organization view the different range of motivation and productivity and satisfaction that we see among different people that have given their time in kind, from their hearts, to Morocco, to communities, to the work of the foundation. Um, volunteers have made... Uh, well, first of all, we, we wouldn't be here without volunteers. Uh, the, the founders were volunteers. The first eight years of the organization was entirely 100% driven by volunteers. We've planted, of the millions that we planted, hundreds of thousands of trees through those eight years were planted. The money was raised. The organization, coordination, and implementation, and evaluation, all done by volunteers. When you look at 2008 till now, the past 10 years, the, the board of directors from the beginning and always have, have been, it's a volunteer position and they have made essential contributions till today. When I think of last year, our major proposals that were funded were um, volunteers had a central role in the research and drafts and um, um, the the different components that are included in a proposal, they were behind all of that. So they've had um, financial they, they, resources that they brought to the organization. They've evaluated, documented, observed projects and written about them. They have provided statements of adv advocacy and policy uh, to the di different dimensions of the work of the foundation, including women's empowerment, youth development, um, education, health, agriculture, migration, the full range of activities that we've been involved with have been written about, not just in terms of um, a assessing the projects themselves, but also in regards to policy development. Um, and, um, of course, you know, none of these things occur by themselves, but always through the um, collaboration with Hof staff, with myself, with our s senior team, with our managers, and so forth, our, our trainers. But still, the, the amount of um, uh, Abdul Hedi, our web designer, sitting in front of me, uh, was a volunteer for months. So much our, of our staff, most of our staff, paid staff, were all volunteers at one point. So when you ask, so, uh, you know, on uh, volunteers are important, as important to the organization as is its participatory approach to the organization. We are defined by community determination of projects, and that's what we dedicate ourselves to. That's our reason for being, and we could never achieve our reason for being without volunteers, and we would never even have conceived our reason for being without the experience of volunteering. So um, it, it's, it's, it's our constitution. It's who we are. It's our nature. Now, when we look at the different levels of uh, or, or kinds of results that we've seen from individual volunteers, if we took a, if we, you know, looked at a hundred and measured the amount of productivity and satisfaction that they've had and 
um, integration in the Hoff team and how smooth that has been. And, um, you know, if we, if we broke it, if we tried to analyze the range of outcomes and the, the, the levels and the quantities and the med, if we try to measure all of that, there are differences. And um, even when you look at myself over the past 18 years, I'm not the same performer at the same level all the time. I have better years than others. I have better months than others. We are human beings. And so, you know, there's that difference is very, it's absolutely normal. However, when, and of those hundred volunteers, I, I'm thinking of two of the hundred that I recall feeling that they left not completely satisfied. You know, we just, le we just had a volunteer, as you know, today. Mm -hmm. She just left, and that when volunteers leave, we all gather, the entire staff, everyone expresses how they feel about that person and what, that ex you know, what they shared before that send-off, and then we present the certificate of completion, and we all come together. And as you know, it's a very special moment. Special. And, and it always is so. But we've had moments where maybe the person left early, or um, it, it, it wasn't as we all would have liked. And that's, you know, it, to, okay, it happens. It's very rare, but it happens. And, but from my point of view, I don't look to that volunteer. What is it, you know, that volunteer, this or that, could have, uh, leaves early, or, you know, blamed us for something that we could not control. I don't think in terms of that. When a volunteer experiences something less satisfactory, I look to myself, and I look to us as a team. What did we do, or could have done, or didn't do, or needed to do, or well, how can we think and do differently in the future so that that experience would have been positive, will be positive instead. There is absolutely no thought that I have to say that volunteer um, was responsible for his or her own dissatisfaction. I don't, I don't see that. I, I blame well, not blame, but I, I look within ourselves as to the reason why that dissatisfaction may have taken place and that we need to come together as a team and analyze that and do better next time and find out why it's so and put measures in place so it doesn't happen. So that's how I see that the results that we have is a reflection of how we do our own work. And so we are ultimately responsible for, you know, for the, the outcomes that we experience. And I will say, I add this too, that I take the same attitude when we have, you know, not all projects are as perfect as we will them to be or that we envision them or that the community really wants them to be. That there are situations that arise, some we can control, some we can't, but in any case, things happen and that, you know, we have 15 nurseries we're associated with, we partner with, we help. Are all of them perfectly green, lush, and high maximum productivity? No. Why? Why may one or two be less so? And so I don't think to myself, or, or a, a, a workshop, why did this workshop do better than another one? I don't see, analyze and say, what is it with those participants in that workshop that made it not so good? I look to ourselves and our team and say, this project, this community initiative, yes, it's in, owned and designed and managed and benefits the, com the local people, but it didn't work as well as it should have. Why? And, and, and what is it within us that makes that so.
and, and I would hope, you know, and it's the same thing we need to look at in terms of our relationships in our lives. Our relationships with our children, with our spouses, with our parents, with our siblings. It, it's so easy to, it's not easy, I mean, there's a lot of pain, and I understand that, you know, um, there are actions other people take that don't serve our best needs sometimes. But we still have to look within ourselves and say, why did that happen to me? And what's going on inside of myself, and my mind, and my heart, and my behavior that brought that upon? And, um, and, and as an organization, we can look at that too, and perhaps even as a country. You know, we, we can't blame the world for our worldly difficulty. That uh, we're, you know, we are, what we experience is a reflection of ourselves. And, um, and so that's what we need to focus on as we manage volunteers, as we manage our relationships, as we manage our projects, as we manage our external relationships. It's really about who we are and how we try to progress in this world. Next question, <laughs> again. Um, what do you think, in your opinion, are the main source of motivation um, for volunteers? That's a good question. <laughs> there are a couple of, um, of course, we. We can look in at our own experience and say what what may have encouraged us to take a certain path. But in, in terms of the, so in reflecting upon that, but also reflecting upon um, the volunteers I've had as colleagues in the Peace Corps, the volunteers that I've um, was part of supervising in the Peace Corps, the the, the hundreds that we've had as an organization. In general, I'd say there are perhaps two, I'm sure there's so many more, but if we had to sort of put an umbrella, there are generally two, I would say. One is that there's an element of discovery uh, that volunteers seem to have, discovery of self, discovery of the world, and I'm not too, the two are so separable, but um, there's an element of searching. Um, searching for more understanding of what we do well, what we like to do, what we like to dedicate ourselves toward. Searching in regards to even broader meaning, what what is my purpose in this life? What, what, um, what's really important to me? And that's really important uh, and to have that opportunity to explore in that way. And it's very honest. And it's beautiful. And it's rewarded. You know, I, I'm not sure how else. It's probably the most r rewarded form of searching. Because there's an element of giving. It's, it's selfless. You're giving yourself over to a situation that you don't know. You don't know what you'll experience. You don't know the people you'll meet. Um, there's an ele level of risk. You're in a place that usually is not close to home. Sometimes you are, sometimes not. But you're definitely putting yourself in an environment that is more often than not new, different than what we're used to. 
So you're giving yourself to a, oneself to a path of that allows for self-analysis but also the expenditure of energy and time for others without material gain and without knowing where you'll end up being or facing or who you'll meet or your next meal. And there's also a level of discomfort because sometimes you're going to be in a cold place or you're going to be in an exceedingly hot place and you're going to be lonely and you're going to be looked at you're going to be often distrusted. People will be unsure of your intention. You may be insulted, followed, even alienated, perhaps even despised. And yet, People do, still do it in the millions and have done it in certain ways as long as there have been people. There's been this service. As long as there have been an awareness of trying to assist the other, which I assume was from the beginning of time, of human time, of our... And so... Um, there's something um, exceedingly eternal and beautiful and human about that. And because there's that sense of risk and uncertainty and yet generosity, somehow the universe rewards that. Never, you, can't, you can't take it for granted. We're never quite sure how. The reward may come in different forms. It may not be immediate. But somehow... At the end of it, as long as we're okay physically, and dear God, that's most important, really, that we come out of it okay and healthy. But somehow we're, we're, we benefit. And that's the other part I'd want to say. That oftentimes a motivation is to enable a promotion or a... Um, a growth in a uh, socially understood way. It could be a degree. It could be a, um, you know, um, it's, it's now something that universities measure how many hours of volunteering. It's now a requirement. Um, and so yes to the exploration, but now there's a um, professional purpose behind it. And overall, that's quite okay. That's quite okay. As long as there's the openness to inner consideration. As long as it's as important that we have the desire to grow in our thinking, in our perspective, in our compassion, in our understanding, in our mercy, and all, you know, as long as we want to improve as a human being as part of this process of giving, and that's, a, that's our motivation, then, you know, having some kind of practical benefit college credit, you know, all those things, then, you know, it's, it's, it's all right. Because actually then that motivation or that requirement and that counting of hours can actually inspire more people to pursue a path of volunteering and self-exploration. It could be an incentive. And if sometimes we need that incentive, then okay. You know, is, is a Peace Corps volunteer entirely selfless? I don't think so. I mean, it can't, is a human being. But, you know, I know Peace Corps volunteers, you know, they, they're from the heart, and they, you know, we, we do our best. Uh, but there are huge opportunities for graduate school. 
I, I, the school I went to at Clark University had a relationship with the Peace Corps. There are scholarship programs for graduate school following the Peace Corps. You, you are called a volunteer, but you are giving a living wage and um, sustenance and shelter and clothing. And, you, you know, you can purchase with that living wage and you're doing okay. You, you're not hungry. You have great health insurance. You're actually part of the federal government system. You have a, you have a, a demarcation level. You have an allowance when you're done of some thousands of dollars so that you have a time to readjust and pursue your next endeavor. So if, if it didn't have all of that, who would become a Peace Corps volunteer? Would I become a be knowing without the health insurance or without this, the way to sustain myself? No one, you know, you, you can't really do it. And you're doing it for two plus years and that's, a, that's like a job. Yeah, I mean, it is a job. And you're called a volunteer, and, but, you know, there, and you are a volunteer. But, um, you know, to, to have the, motiv the, the, the part of the motivation of being able to grow professionally is an important motivation, a worthy motivation, but ought not to be, uh, to overshadow or to be more predominant than the personal growth that really is the defining greatest benefit that we get from volunteering. Thank you. Um, do you have a specific motivation for this um, and for volunteers and what are they? That's a good question. Um, it's, it's, um, and it kind of it relates to the previous question in a way that um, in order to keep volunteers motivated and productive and satisfied and um, giving of their best energy and wanting to come here in the morning and wanting to go on travels with our staff and to, to in order to volunteer in, with the best possible motivation that volunteer assignment has to couple, bring together two things. One is that it has to reflect what that volunteer wants to do. It, it, it has to um, utilize the skills of that volunteer or the skills that that volunteer wants to develop. It, um, it has to in, involve a subject matter or a project type that's particularly important to that volunteer. Whatever it may be, but it's important that the time is spent in a way that is meaningful to that individual volunteer. And at the same time, it has to advance the agenda, mission, plan, uh, objectives, priorities, needs of the organization. And it really has to do both very well in order to, for the program to work, for the volunteer um, initiative to, to grow as it's growing. And so how do we do that? How do we both meet the volunteer's personal goals and the organization's? at the same time. And that has to come through conversation. We have to talk. We have to um, learn about each other, the experiences, um, analyze those experiences, what that volunteer liked, may not have liked, prior experiences, I mean. Um, the future that that volunteer sees for herself, himself, the, the courses that they've liked, that they didn't, um, the successes, the joys, the professional joys, the, the, the less successes, the relationships. It, you really have to get a sense of that person 
in terms of the, the professional background and to the extent of personal background that the volunteer wants to introduce into that conversation. And then comes, at the same time, in one's, in, you know, as I go through these kinds of conversations, I also have another thing going in my mind at, at some point of the, um, the range of activities we have going on and to see and to start drawing connections between the two. Sometimes it's a 15-minute conversation. Sometimes it's a half hour. Sometimes it's an ongoing one. And in most cases, it's, you know, it's something that you, you find after that first conversation. You find what it is, and you move on it, and you introduce the team around it, and then you come back together again and you know, look at it again and see. And so it's a, it's a fluid process. But that is really our approach our policy that um, we we have to be able to meet both needs at the same time and that emerges through discussion thank you um, so how do we evaluate the level of motivation of volunteers how do we evaluate the level Uh, probably not as rigorously or as quantitatively or even as consistently as we should. I'll tell you one of the ways that impresses upon me and that has actually made a difference in terms of how in the future I've um, frame the recommendations for those volunteers as they go forward in their professional paths. I refer to that gathering at the end before the volunteer departs and everyone speaks. The, it's actually a form of evaluation. Mm -hmm. And here's one example. We had a, a volunteer leave um, a month ago or so, maybe more. Um, month or two and several staff and other volunteers in during that when we all everyone spoke um, uh, prior to that volunteer leaving several people s mentioned how that particular spot where the volunteer sat for some months was where w was that volunteers place. And that even when that volunteer was not there and we brought guests in, we would refer to that volunteer, and well that's where that volunteer sits. It, 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 the person was such a part of the team that that was uh, always referred to whether that volunteer was there or not. And when her prospective employer called me, she subsequent, or, you know, the person got, got a job um, following her departure, her following her volunteer, her volunteer experience with us. But w but when they had called us to, you know, learn more about that candidate for a position. Those comments that took place prior to her departure from us were very much left a real impression on me. I, I knew from my own interaction and observation and work with that volunteer how important she was. But I didn't know that she was, you know, the, I'm sorry, uh, but the, the volunteer was so... Um, deeply part of everyone and so integrated and so connected and so appreciated um, and um, you know at, when as an employer when you're considering hiring someone you know there of course you want the professional skills and the outlook and all of those things 
but you also want someone who's kind and friendly and part of the team and nice to be around and a good person and, and those kinds of things. And, and I always knew she was, but I, but I knew that she was incredibly so after that. And um, so, you know, that's one of the ways that we measure motivation is that coming together and having everyone speak, including that volunteer. And then from there, you really get a sense of um, how important to what, ex- you know, how important and meaningful that experience was for that individual as, and for everyone. And I guess you'll have yours next week. Yes, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> On Friday. Friday. Yeah, Friday. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, does the motivation of volunteers in the heart lead to a real performance of the foundation? The real performance? Mm-hmm. What do you mean by real performance? Um, what are the impact, impact of the heart performance? Um, if you can give a uh, A funded proposal. Um, um, project reports on all projects in all places, photo documentation, uh, policy papers, st- statements, um, a huge amount of social media, um, and then so many, those are broad categories, but then as things come up, uh, we needed to evaluate um, 30 proposals that we received as we are considering subgrants. Or 30 in Morocco, 30 in Jordan. They were really helpful uh, to our project managers in that area. Translations. Um, 28 of the more than 100 volunteers we've had through 2018, 2019, 28 uh, were farmer-to-farmer volunteers. These are agricultural experts coming from the U.S. without language, uh, Arabic language background, generally, and um, volunteers were um, escorted them as they visited communities and project sites and provided translation and background and and so forth. Other than financial management, although we've had expert volunteers provide financial management workshops, um, but I I think volunteers have been part of every aspect of our organization. I'm not sure I can think of, other than, you know, liaisoning with the board of directors, which is only one person does that, and uh, that's myself, other than that. Although I even think there has been interaction between volunteers and the board. So, oh, uh, uh, event coordination, organization planning. Um, so the, the areas that they have made a difference are all of the areas that compose the operations of the organization. That's it. Is that all your questions? Um, yes. One more question. Go ahead. Um, do you find the volunteer motivation techniques that you apply here are efficient? And why? Um, I think we can improve upon efficiency. The challenge that we have is that um, uh, we, there's so many, there's a lot of things happening at the same time. And, um, and a lot of people traveling, a lot of movement. And so I think that, um, I think in the past, and maybe even every volunteer to some extent experiences where, you know, was there potential we didn't achieve? Could this volunteer have gone on this workshop in the field 
and gain that experience? Could, could it, it, you know, did they know on time to, or in a timely way to, um, to be able to help on this document or to travel to this place with our team or to be able to photograph or interview or, um, I'm, I'm sh you know, in that regard, I feel it's a, it's now I feel like we're always doing better. We're committed to doing better. It's about communication and all these things. But I also feel that, um, you know, I, I it, it occurs. Now, on on some level, it's 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 bound to happen with so much movement in different places, different activities, such intensity. On another level, um, you know, we need to be always asking ourselves, is every volunteer spending their time in the best way they could in the way that the organization and they as individuals want? And I think, you know, um, the arc moves up with improvement, but I do think we sort of, you know, it, it doesn't move at the rate or the pace mm -hmm. that we all would like, and that maybe even sometimes there are dips. There may be dips if I'm not in Morocco. There may be dips if Rashid, our volunteer manager, is in Qatar where he had to go. Or, you know, or uh, our senior staff, they're traveling a lot. Or, you know, they're... So, um, but still, even with all of that, there should be ways, mechanisms... Uh, paths of communication that deal with all of those circumstances. So I think that's really the one area where um, we are always we're aware of and we need to improve and we're doing better, um, not 100 percent, but uh, we need to do better because uh, for one is, um, you know, few things hurt more than loss of potential when it could be avoided. Nothing hurts more. Hardly anything hurts more when, um, you know, entire girl, uh, all the girls of a village or even municipality don't go to continue on to middle school. And imagine that. Overbearing loss of potential. So, um, you know, I know that's an extreme form I've just said, but still, uh, in some small measure, you know, it's a loss of time and opportunity, and we need to not allow that to happen. Thank you so much, sir, <laughs> for giving me your time. I know you are busy, so um, I can't thank you too much. Or giving to or to manage to give um, uh, to us me and Selena your time for one day maybe. <laughs> well, let me ask you this: of everything I said about volunteering, did it um, did it show to be the case in your volunteer experience? Did what I described to you um, also describe how you had your volunteer experience? Yes, a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, this is my first time to be considered as, as a volunteer. So this is the first experience for me. And I was not expect that I would love it like I'm enjoying it the, um, this way. Uh, yeah, what motivated me the the most is that my seven day here when we talk by Skype you ask me some questions to know more about me and just after that you told to see Hassan to go with me to Cadmont and <laughs> I enjoy it a lot I enjoy it a lot and to see this such of um, almond, walnut, 
that are planted and the fact is that they are give for free to association to to farmers to schools for free and it make me it let me speechless and i was like i can't it can't um completely my my point of view of things of life and yeah i mean <laughs> if you ask me if i am mo- i am motivated i will say completely completely and to meet you was a big thing for me it means a lot for me because um yes we talk by skype by um video call but to see you and to see how motivated how implicated are you for the development of morocco sustainability development local and yeah it means a lot for me and i think that um the world have to recognize that you are doing what you are doing um i i think your recognition is is uh, b- brings the satisfaction that you know brings the satisfaction enough and i'm so grateful to what you said um but you did say something earlier that makes me want to ask you you said you were fully motivated w- why did you come here fully motivated and how do you explain your full motivation um the first time i came here i think i was not motivated because um it was like a discovery for me so i came to see what um half is doing and how they are doing that so the first day i came here i was like observing what is going on and things go like that since um, my first week with Sirius and like I said so since this day everything goes fast for me and why I said that I'm fully motivated so um we go we went with Said and Selina to Ravna in the school um uh, there were a lot of um students there and when we planted trees they are they were all here to see what is going on and said was asking them questions about planting trees um and the advantages of that and they were focused on this motivated and they were happy and when we planted trees they were um fighting to plant trees to mm. have to have the opportunity to plant trees and this make me like i was <laughs> lost I, it was incredible for me i was looking at them and i said that is incredible <laughs> that's uh, really interesting and And you know it uh, and you're saying something so important that I didn't say about motivation and I can't believe I I'm so um <laughs> looking back at my examples of motivation I was really mistaken by not saying this and that is that um people really have the idea of just serving I think I did refer to it but not as directly and um you know as as perfectly as you and that is that what really is motivating for you f- and I think for me certainly and for s- volunteers is that that to have these kinds of moments um for me early on when every parent in the community meeting lost children to 
waterborne diseases. And a father lost 18 children, not to more than one wife, but lost 18. He did. And so it's the communities and their stories and needs and, um, you know, the hardness of life and the gratefulness of the lives that we have that compel us, motivate us to try to bring some kind of good to others. And what makes children fight to plant trees? I mean, on one level, that sounds like a lot of motivation. And, but on another level, you know, wouldn't it have been nice if they've had that opportunity to just simply plant at their school? And it's almost as if they're starving to plant. You know, we, we just need to do it. And, um, and so, but hopefully that opened up a doorway for many more opportunities for them to plant at their homes every season, at their schools again, and that they'll ask teachers for it, and that we'll come back if they would like us to, and, and so forth. But you, yes, our motivation are those children Does anyone else want to say anything? Elias, Abdul Hadi, anybody? All right. So thank you, Musa. I'll be I'll be traveling these next few days, but I will be here on Friday, your last day. And uh, and thank you, Abdul Hadi, for spending this day with us. And thank you, Elias, for for recording. It's a nice day to spend with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.